So it's uh, my pleasure to provide a brief introduction to our speaker for this evening, Tom Johnson. Uh, Tom's now a senior technical writer at Amazon Lab 126 in Sunnyvale, California. Uh, uh, many of you probably already know Tom's very popular blog, uh, I'd Rather Be Writing, at uh, www.idratherbewriting.com. It's a really good hub for innovation and exploration in the tech comm field. And you can access more resources on Jekyll uh, in particular, which is what Tom's going to be speaking about this evening, uh, on Tom's site. So I'm very pleased that Tom could speak to us tonight. And uh, he's going to describe his adventures with Jekyll and how he dealt with some of the challenges that it posed in his projects. So let's begin. Please welcome Tom Johnson. All right. Thanks, James. Uh, first of all, I just want to say that I, I'm very informal and I like interactive uh, discussions. So anytime you want to jump in, feel free. You, you can either just uh, speak up or you can use the little chat window. I'll check that out every now and then. But I want this to be as much a discussion as possible. Um, and I'll try to share uh, my, my sort of candid experiences in an honest, transparent way uh, with Jekyll. Uh, to, let's see, James already kind of introduced me, but I'll just say that I, I live in Santa Clara, California, and uh, I work currently at Amazon. I've worked at other places, startups, and in other uh, states as well, and from Florida to Utah, and lived around in different places. Um, <clears throat> so let me jump into a little bit of how I started to use Jekyll and why, and what exactly it is. Uh, at, a, at a previous company, they pretty much hired me with the idea that I would help them move from boring PDF to an awesome help website. Uh, all of the content was pretty much, uh, gen all, the, all of their existing content was generated from internal Confluence pages out to a PDF file. And they wanted they were delivering the PDF file as file attachments or in kind of a Dropbox style fashion uh, to to their customers and they knew that that PDF was kind of uh, it looked old it was hard to update it took a long time to generate and it was a pain to get all the everything looking as they wanted it to so they wanted to move to an awesome help website something modern something that fit into that fits into the current landscape of how web content should look. Uh, so we started to research our, our various options. Um, we first looked at maybe using Oxygen XML with Dita. This was our first attempt. Uh, started to convert over a couple of small projects as a pilot. Um, and we designed a, <clears throat> the web help skin with Oxygen to look uh, as, as good as possible, matching the corporate branding and so forth. But we found that uh, it, it just felt a little too restrictive. Um, and that's no doubt in part from our choice to use all the specialized topic types and data, the task, the concept, reference, and so on. And it was just kind of a pain. And, and, and it was also hard to really control that output. Um, when, you're, when you're working with data to influence what the web output looks like, you have to understand the uh, XML transforms and, and how that language works, <coughs> which was something we, we weren't that familiar with. So our second attempt was to try using WordPress multi-site. Uh, WordPress multi-site is the ability to have lots of different WordPress sites that are all kind of tied together through a central hub where you can control the, the themes on each of them. Um, and, and I had a background in WordPress. I used to do WordPress consulting, and I'm very familiar with how to design WordPress themes. So we tried to do that. And, and you know, we got a, a pilot model working, but we found that um, WordPress required too much infrastructure. Um, just getting getting the, the whole LAMP stack, the Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP set up and running in a corporate environment using corporate servers, uh, being able to access those, configure those, and then uh, making it scale across the many different products that we had 
it, it was too much uh, too much setup. You know, WordPress is great if you have a if you have like an external web host that takes care of all those details and makes it super simple to create a database and set up your theme and just let it run. But when you have to do all of that yourself, it is uh, quite a headache. So our third option that we started to look at was static site generators. Now static site generators are, it's a somewhat of an, a new term to describe kind of an old thing. Um, a, a static site generator essentially builds a website, but it's static. Um, and there are lots of different static site generators available. The, this site, this site, Static Gen, which uh, I should go to here, lists all the top open source static site generators, and there are quite a few. Um, if, if I'm looking on this, uh, there. Are are probably hundreds. I think there are several hundred different ones. A lot of them you've probably never heard of, or that I've never heard of. Uh, can't even pronounce half of them. Uh, but <laughs> I guess they're fairly easy to make. Um, but it, all, that, all that static site generators really do is iterate through a bunch of files, usually Markdown. Uh, they can apply some logic, some scripting logic that, that, that can do some, some cool things. And then it packages them up into HTML as a as a website that you then deploy on a server, but you don't need any infrastructure to do it. You can see the top um, the top static site generators here. Jekyll is is, is starred the most, um, and then Hugo. This is based on uh, uh, some uh, a different language based on the Go language, uh, and then Hexo. And so forth. So they, they vary in terms of their underlying platform and what kind of language they're built on. Pelican, Pelican is built on Python. So if you are working with a specific language, you would probably gravitate towards that as your static set, site generator. Um, so since Jekyll was the most popular, I realized that. Uh, it, would, it would likely have the biggest community, the most tutorials, the most resources, the most longevity. And so we decided to go with Jekyll. And you can find out more about Jekyll at uh, JekyllRB.com. It's based on Ruby. And the, the, the origin of Jekyll, let me back up a sec. The origin of Jekyll is uh, this neat little story with the founder, Tom Preston Werner. He says on Sunday, and he's the guy who, who co-founded GitHub, he says on Sunday, October 19, I sat down in my San Francisco apartment with a glass of apple cider and a clear mind. After a period of reflection, I had an idea. While I'm not specifically trained as an author of prose, he was at that time trying to do a lot of blogging and he had a lot of different hassles with content management systems. I am trained as an author of code. What would happen if I approached blogging from a software development perspective? What would that look like? So he was, I guess at the time, trying to do a lot of writing for different blogs and he had different CMSs. I don't know which ones, uh, probably uh, WordPress, Joomla, Drupal, you name it. And he was just getting frustrated with all the different templates and database configurations and optimization and speed and all this stuff that he really didn't need. He just wanted to write content and publish content. And so he wanted a simpler experience, something that cut away all the fluff and all this unnecessary stuff. Um, and so, since he's a developer, he wanted to approach blogging like a hacker or a developer. How would a developer do it? Would a developer go through all these uh, convoluted content management systems or will they do something different? And in the same vein, I, I would ask the same question. What would happen if we approached technical writing from a software development perspective? Or how would a developer approach technical writing? Um, all right, so a little bit more about static site generators here. Uh, in a typical content management system, you've got a database backend. When a user goes to a page, uh, 
the, the page goes and gets content from the database, brings that content back, and populates the page. With a static site generator, the page is already populated with the content. You generate the whole site on your local machine or on a server first, and once it builds the whole site, then it's it's done. It's available. There's no there's no process of getting anything from a database. So there's absolutely no infrastructure. There's no need for uh, PHP to to do those calls into the database. There's no database. Uh, all you need is a server to display your static HTML. So it's really compelling from that point of view. Being so simple, there's no there's no security requirements that are gonna uh, make you really uh, have to have to do tricks to get it approved. To install Jekyll, um, they, they provide some quick start instructions, um, which if you're already kind of like familiar with Ruby and Bundler and Gems, it probably makes sense. If you're not, you pretty much just have to, uh, first of all, install Ruby and Ruby Gems, and then these commands will work. Um, and I actually contributed a little bit to their quick start instructions. So if you go to it now, you'll get some more detail on what, what the different things are doing. But uh, Ruby Gems is a package manager for Ruby. And it, Jekyll is a gem and Bundler is a gem. So these are essentially plugins for Ruby. And once you have these plugins, then to create a new Jekyll site, you just type Jekyll and then new, and then the name of your site. And it's going to create a Jekyll site at that this directory. Then you change into the directory, and then to run your site, you're going to run essentially Jekyll Surf. This bundle exec just makes sure that you have the right uh, Ruby plugins in order to make it make it happen. Uh, so super simple, as long as you have Ruby Gems and Ruby installed, um, and you can be browsing your site. You you get a preview site here. Um, uh, yeah, and why don't we do that just for fun? Uh, let me check the chat window first. Let me make sure I'm not missing anything. All right, not missing anything. So I'm going to open up. Actually, I'm going to close everything first. I'm going to open up my favorite command terminal, which is uh, iTerm. If you're on a Mac, this is the one to use. And I'm already in my projects directory. So just following this, I've already installed Jekyll and Bundler. So I'm just going to type Jekyll new, I'm going to type SOC site. And it's going to get all the stuff I need. And it's having trouble reaching something, but then it looks like it got it. So it's, it's going out and fetching. This is the bundle part. It's going out and fetching uh, any kind of Ruby gems it needs. And once it does this, Give it a second. Once it finishes this, it will be available and we'll just change into it and start it. Actually, give this a second. Let me check the chat window while I'm here. What is a Ruby gem? Okay, so a Ruby gem is a, a plugin for Ruby. There we go. Uh, it, it adds on to the functionality of the basic uh, Ruby platform, as far as I can tell. Okay, so it installed there. So now we're going to change into that directory. And then we run bundle exec Jekyll serve. And it's going to give us a preview server, which we can then view. So if I go to there. There's our Jekyll site. And the, the vanilla template is very basic. You've got an about page. You've got stuff. It's typically designed as a, as a blogging platform. So that's the default sort of mode. All right. Somebody else has got some stuff. If you don't want to use Linux, OK, so yeah, Windows installation. Good. OK, so that's how easy it is to get up and running with Jekyll. And then if you look at your Jekyll site, let me come into my projects directory, uh, SOC, 
you can see that uh, these are all the files that are involved. You've got a post directory. The site directory is where, you, where the site gets built. And then there's not much here. <laughs> there's actually uh, really a, a scary minimal amount of content. That's in part because um, if, you, if you open up this, this guy right here, uh, the config file, you'll notice that there's a theme called minima. A, a while ago, Jekyll came out with this, this gem-based theme system where they tried to uh, deliver all, most of the theme files in a Ruby gem, like a plugin, that then is, is hidden. So you only see like a subset of the files here. If you, if you actually want to see all of them, um, you're going to have to uh, do <clears throat> bundle show minima. That's the name of the theme. And it will tell you that this is where the rest of your theme files are. So if you open that directory, uh, you can see here are the, the additional files. So if you wanted to get rid of that, that gem theme, you could just strip it out of the configuration file. You can even delete the two gem files. This is, is what Bundler uses to get the latest uh, gems and so forth. Then you could just copy these remaining files into this folder and you'd see everything that's there. Uh, or the way that the gem-based themes are designed to work is that if you have anything in your main folder, it will overwrite any similar files in the gem-based theme. Now, the only reason I jumped into that is because um, uh, the default Jekyll theme is a gem-based theme, so you might get a little hung up, but most themes actually aren't gem-based themes. They just deliver all the files that you work with right in the same directory. They don't try to hide anything and that's it makes a lot more sense to me. Okay, let me just check the chat. Uh, okay. All right, let me keep... Oh wait, I just saw a question. So the CSS is in the gem theme. Uh, yeah, yeah, let me jump back. Now, there's actually something quite cool about the CSS. You'll notice that there there isn't actually CSS. All you see is a SAS folder. SAS stands for Syntactically Awesome Style Sheet Syntax. And you should read about it. It's pretty simple to pick up. And the, the base the default theme for for Jekyll uses SAS. You could just use CSS. But what Jekyll can do is take and convert or pre-process your SAS files or SCSS files into CSS. So when you go into the site to see what's built in the output under assets, you see that you just see the main CSS. That's because if we looked at um, where is that main file? Uh, if we looked at the main file, wherever we find that, uh, it would just include these SCSS files and convert them from from uh, from the, the SAS format into CSS and it will minify them. So you get minification, compression, all that stuff right when Jekyll builds. Anyway, uh, I don't want to get too far into that. Okay, let me keep going a little bit. Why do people like Jekyll? It's simple, it's stable, meaning you're not going to get um, your server is not going to go down, your database isn't going to go down. I don't know how many times when I was on WordPress that I would go check my site and it would just be down because the database was down or the server was down or something. Um, Jekyll's super secure. Since it's just HTML and everything's pre-built, then there's no security issues at all. It's, it's kind of crazy to have a login system that anybody can access like WordPress does. If you go to anybody's WordPress site and just type slash wp-admin, and you're presented with the ability to log in if you can guess the credentials, that poses huge security risks, which is why so many WordPress sites get hacked. Uh, I, uh, yeah, um, not having to worry about the hacks is huge. When I did WordPress consulting, I don't know how many times I had, pro well, I could probably guess, at least a dozen times I had different clients who would have their site be hacked, and it was a pain in the butt to figure out what exactly was the malicious code in there. Uh, they're lightweight. The whole files is minimal. We're talking, these are text files. Unless you have a bunch of images, it's going to be like one meg max. 
and they're fast because everything's built. You don't have to do that round tripping where you go and get content from the database. The pages are going to load extremely quickly like that. Okay, now what doc sites are using Jekyll? You've got a number of them here you can check out. Granted, not a whole lot in the larger context of doc sites, but here's some, some possibilities. Um, this is one that, that I like uh, a lot, Liquid from Shopify. This is a company that makes uh, like these e-commerce websites where people have a lot of content. And you can see they've got a nice looking set of documentation uh, with nice search, nice drop downs. And actually I've met the, one of the help writers here and, and I know this is Jekyll based. They're actually thinking about moving to middleman for reasons I can't entirely understand, but uh, they're still in the static site generator world. Um, okay, let's keep moving on. What does it mean to write tech docs like a hacker? You use some kind of site generator like Jekyll, could be Middleman, could be Pelican, any of these that that are just gonna package up your, your content and render it out as HTML. You're working in text files in some text editor. You could work in Sublime. I really like WebStorm. Uh, Atom is a very popular editor from GitHub and more. Um, you can use scripting languages like Liquid for advanced logic. Uh, Liquid is kind of like a safe version of JavaScript that you can, and a simplified version of JavaScript where you can run a bunch of things like for loops and if if conditions and all these, all these things. Um, collaborate using source control like Git as well as do versioning with it. And you could actually do the building of the whole site uh, on the server. And my blog is run on Jekyll uh, and it's hosted on GitHub. So when I have an update to my blog, um, essentially all I do is commit the latest uh, change into GitHub. And then GitHub has these hooks in its server that will detect that it's a Jekyll site and it will automatically do that building that we were showing here earlier where it, where it did this building of the files. So all that happens on the server. I don't have to do anything um, if I don't want to. So this, this default site took like a second or less to build, but when you have hundreds of posts, it can take upwards of one to two minutes or more. Let me check the questions. No questions, okay. All right, so I'm going to describe my journey for using Jekyll with tech writing. Um, I sort of giving you the basics of how Jekyll works, what it consists of, but figuring out how to make, make it work with all the different needs that you have as a technical writer. Uh, everything from robust navigation to links that don't break to multiple outputs to PDF, all that stuff. Very much a gray area. Not There's not a lot of information. Jekyll was designed by somebody who wanted to use it for a blogging engine. So the use cases, the templates, the tutorials are often designed around basic websites, not tech doc websites. So I had to figure out a lot of stuff. First thing was the site. How do you design the site? Because it comes with this vanilla vanilla theme, which, you know, it looks okay, but I wanted to have a theme that looked more tech doc like. So what I did is the the cheap way, I just cheated and used a bootstrap theme. If you don't know, Bootstrap is a great site that basically contains pre-built website components that you easily drop in and and those pre-built components can extend all the way to a, an actual template as well for the whole site uh, and once you have this <clears throat> this template then you can choose any kind of component you want you want nav tabs do you want special buttons do you want drop downs do you want anything uh, do you want you want the whole thing to be responsive it's all built in so creating a theme uh, for Jekyll is actually really simple uh, let me come back to that set of Jekyll files and let me actually open it up. Let me uh, 
I'll open it up in my, my little WebStorm editor. And projects. And sort by name. SOC site. Okay. So there's a folder called layouts and the default is usually where the content is. You can clone any site, copy it into layouts, and then just add this little tag called content inside two curly braces. And then your content from a page or post that uses that layout will just get stuffed into here. So you can take anything. You could take your company's website, grab the source code, paste it in here, find where the content should be populated, add these tags, and then in the post, if I go to, or the page, at the top, it specifies which layout you want to use. And then this content that appears here gets pushed into that little content part there. So that's the extent of theming, really, in Jekyll. And based on that, you could take and clone your, your company's site or do anything. You can convert a bootstrap theme that's not a Jekyll theme, convert it into a Jekyll site very easily. So that is definitely a huge win. Another challenge was content reuse. Let's say you have one reusable component and you want to, to, to make it appear in multiple places, right? This is the most common sort of uh, feature that TechDocs really likes, likes to promote in single sourcing. Well, there's a feature called includes in, in almost every static site generator like in Sphinx, they're called partials and on other systems. I believe they're called partials anyway. But let's say you have a file called my file and you've got it in this little directory here called includes. Uh, or actually, here's an, a better example. Let's say you've got a file called head.html and you want to include it in a certain place. Well, you just use this little include syntax and it's going to pull the file right there. You could do this. This is used for a layout that's because multiple layouts have the same head, head matter. But let's say you have a note that you reuse or another a, a subhead a section on a page. You can just create a folder or subfolder, organize all that content you want to reuse, and then add these little include tags wherever you want them. So that's fairly easy enough. What about conditional filtering? Let's say you have some content that should only apply to a certain audience and other content that should apply to another. And this gets into the common sort of question I usually hear is that how do you do more robust, uh, sophisticated content things with something so primitive as Markdown? Well, Markdown itself doesn't have any conditional filtering. But fortunately, uh, Jekyll allows you to use Liquid, which is a scripting language that is very similar to JavaScript. It's basically Shopify wanted to make a way for all these people who had merchant sites to use the same logic in JavaScript, but not to actually be able to use JavaScript because they could potentially uh, run into um, situations where users inject malicious code. So they wanted to not allow certain things, but allow um, the same logic. So they invented this, this scripting language called Liquid, so it's very similar. But if you have a, you, you can use an if statement like this, where you've got if a site audience is administrators, then do this. And if it's something else, then do this. And it's very simple syntax with if, else if, and if, uh, all wrapped up in the little curly brace followed by a, a percentile sign. And um, so based on this, you store these variables, site.audience. This would get stored, excuse me, in your config file. So if I have a config file um, here and I put my site.audience, or sorry, audience uh, administrators, then this value becomes available. Uh, through site dot to this namespace. Anyway, uh, it turns out to be fairly simple, uh, and I'll get more into this a little later. So using the same technique, you can you can then create multiple outputs. A very common scenario in TechCom is to have an output specific to audience one, two, and three, and so forth. And when I worked at, at the company where we were implementing Jekyll, we ne had a, a need for an output 
that was specific to different programming languages, PHP, .NET, Java, and wanted to completely separate them out. So what we did is we opened up our configuration file, we added whatever we wanted here, uh, like uh, for example language, PHP, and uh, uh, whatever values. And then in the content we would uh, use these same tags that we used here and so forth uh, to, to separate them out. And that way we were able to generate them. So you each output just uses a, uses a different configuration file and for uh, the for example PHP output we'd have a certain configuration file and for the Java output had another configuration file each with its own unique values in that configuration file when the site builds it would use the values from that configuration file so not really rocket science it's just a basic way to do the multiple outputs uh, uh, there we go, I'm just explaining what I just explained. Another challenge was to get the multi-level navigation menu. This is probably the most difficult aspect because you not only want just a list of links, we wanted multi-level, first, second, third level, collapsible, uh, expandable, maybe even an accordion effect. And the solution there is a little bit different. Uh, essentially, you, you, you store items in a YAML file. So let me open this up. Uh, the default, this doesn't actually have one. Okay, so I won't get into it. The default theme in Jekyll doesn't have one. But you, you create a data folder. You put a file in there in a YAML format, which is a format that doesn't depend on any markup, line, markup syntax. And then you use a for loop in HTML to iterate through the items in the YAML file and to push each of the items into the HTML formatting that you want. It sounds a little bit more complicated than it actually is, but it's a way of separating the data from the presentation. Um, and it's a fairly common technique. I uh, actually was talking at one time with some writers at GitHub and they explained that this was the approach they took and it's really not hard to do it. The for loop is kind of a really interesting thing uh, that you suddenly have access to in Jekyll because of Liquid. But basically, anytime you have a collection of things, a list of things, you can iterate through that list and do something with each list item. It's sort of like JavaScript 101, where you, you iterate through, through lists of things. And you apply that same uh, iteration model into your tech docs in order to do that. So you can you can use these for loops for all kinds of things uh, beyond just the navigation. Uh, I'll jump more into that maybe in another time. Let's see if we have any questions. Do you have to build or set the server hooks or how does that work? So the server. There's something called GitHub pages that's going to make that easy. But yeah, if you were if you were doing this on your own server, you would you would use something called uh, can't remember what it's called. I think it's GitHub hook or something, or, or not, or Pages hook or something, Jekyll hook. Anyway, the easy way to do it, and the way that most people do do it, is to store your content on GitHub, and then use uh, something called GitHub Pages. And you can see how you set it up here. Uh, you can either use like their existing templates, or you can specify that you're setting up a Jekyll site. Um, Follow the tutorials for how to do it, but basically GitHub has the server hooks available for you already. And then it's just a matter of, of configuring the GitHub repository correctly, and then it, it just works out of the box. And GitHub is almost never down. I have uh, Pingdom reports on my site, and it's always like either 100% or like 99.99%. Whereas when I had a WordPress site with Bluehost, it was like 98% or something. Small, but 2% is actually results in hours of time that you can suddenly be down. Let me see if I have any more. Okay. But yeah, if you wanted to do that on your own, you could also do that. It's obviously more technical, but you can put those hooks in. And this is this is sort of a this is a paradigm. I'll just pause here for a small tangent. This is a model that I'm starting to see a lot more where people are building their site 
on the server. Uh, you see that even outside of um, the, the developer static site generator world. If you have a Flare project, now Madcap has come out with this Madcap Central uh, thing where you commit your Flare project to their server, their Madcap Central server, and then you can make it so that the build scripts execute on the server, builds your Flare project, and, and, and there you have it. You don't have to, to build it locally. You're just committing to some repository and having the, the place where that repository lives uh, do the building of your site. I think that's really the way to go. And there's probably lots of different ways to do it. This is just one. What about all those notes, tips, and cautions? Well, uh, there's a way to create, you, you use the same technique with, with includes. You can store a whole template in your include and then uh, reference different parameters um, like this. The, this. I can't really articulate this very well, but essentially when you have this uh, content parameter, you can specify what the parameter is and then this parameter will then populate this part in the template. So you have a, a template that is defined up here and then you populate its parameters when you call it. And you can do all kinds of advanced things with this, not just little simple notes and alerts, but you could do images, you could do uh, more sophisticated formatting. Anyway, it's, it's a cool thing. What about broken links? Trying to find out all those places where you have broken links? Well, there is no good answer for this in the static site generator world. I went to extensive uh, attempts to do different hacks, uh, kind of like the, an indirect referencing system where you've got um, key value pairs set up in YAML files and it simulates a markdown reference format and so forth. But at the end of the day, um, there's nothing really that will prevent you from getting broken links. Now, since I initially kind of was presenting about this, Jekyll has come out with a, a new link tag that will make it so that uh, you, you can avoid broken links, but you can't do bookmarks with it, so it's kind of limited. Or right, what about PDF output? This is a huge challenge, and you know, I'm con constantly surprised by the popularity of PDF output. Um, if you look at recent surveys, the 2016 benchmarking survey with Scott Abel or the latest Writers UA survey, uh, in Scott's survey, 49% of the people said that PDF output was important. And in Joe's survey, the Writers UA survey, he said that like 79% of people said that print output was important. But with static site generators, there's nothing that really generates a PDF. Uh, what I ended up doing was using this this hack. Uh, it's called Prince XML. Let me just go to it um, because it's a cool utility that even if you didn't use Jekyll, it's worth knowing about because it allows you to to convert HTML documents to PDF in powerful ways and use CSS to style the whole thing. You don't you don't have to use XSLFO. Uh, to to do your rendering of, of your content you can just work with CSS and HTML so my approach to generating PDF because it was a requirement at, at this company I was at was to generate a long list of links and you you feed that list of links into um, prints that's you work with it on the command line you feed it this list of links and it it combines all of those links into one master PDF and it will add cross-references. Uh, if you have a table of contents pointing to them, it will correctly add, add references, page numbers. You can add headers, footers. You can even add uh, little timestamps and other JavaScript. So it's really quite cool. It's not free. It's $500, but it's definitely worth it if, you're, if, you, need to get, if you need to get PDF. OK. Let me see if we've got some other questions here. Uh, okay, somebody asked a question. Reuse across projects. Now this is a, a huge dilemma that we had. We started out where everybody had their own Jekyll project. 
and they were, they were all siloed. But very quickly, I realized a couple of limitations. One is that when I had an update to the theme, I suddenly had to apply that update to every single Jekyll project where that theme was. And it was a pain because um, I'd usually have to explain to the person, hey, here's how, here's what you need to do, change the CSS, add this file, and nobody wanted to do that. The other problem was that uh, not every writer in our team was super savvy with Jekyll. They'd run into issues, things wouldn't build, and it was hard to troubleshoot them, right? Because it, they had their own project and uh, it made it difficult to access and, and troubleshoot. So we decided one day that instead of having separate projects, oh, actually there's one other driver, which is what this screenshot is actually trying to communicate. Sometimes we, we had content in one project that we wanted to share in another project. Uh, and when you, when you have content that needs to be shared across projects, it made it, it, there was no way to do it really. So what we ended up doing was making one master project for all the writers. So we didn't, no longer had separate silos, separate repos for pr different projects. Everybody worked in the same project and we used version control uh, each project can be stored in its own subfolders uh, and you can specify maybe stuff you want to exclude for different builds but having everybody work out of the same repo is is awesome I really like that model the only problem is that if you get too much content then your, your Jekyll site builds more slowly so it's kinda nice if you could separate things into different repos but the, the trade-offs just aren't worth it uh, but it's fun to see what other people commit when you do git pull and you suddenly see that Joe or Sally or whatever has made all kinds of updates. It's fun to look through and see it and to be part of the same same system. Um, when I worked in another uh, environment in MediaWiki, it was a, the same sense of exhilaration to, to have different writers working in different areas and updating different pages and seeing all these changes come in and having it be rolled up into the same system is a lot of fun. Uh, as far as version control workflows, this is somewhat new territory for a lot of tech writers. So we, uh, at this company we were at, where we first started using Jekyll, we had to use Mercurial, which is not as user-friendly as Git. And so we'd often run into merge conflicts and we had to figure out like how we simplify things, uh, what commands. There's you know, engineers are very accustomed to, to working in version control, but it takes a while um, if you're new to it. So we had to figure that out. And we, of course, ran into merge conflicts. And sometimes the only way to f resolve it was to, like, redownload the project and figure out what you'd changed. Um, fortunately, since I've switched to Git, those sort of days are in my past, and I've not run into anything. Git seems a lot more friendly. I don't know if I'm just more familiar with it now, but... Um, Basically, merge conflicts happen when two different writers make changes on the same file uh, during the same like time frame and uh, between commits. And then when you commit it, Git says, "Hey, you, th this change conflicts with this other change this other person made in the same part of the file." So now you have to resolve it. What Git does is it, it removes it from the tracking workflow and inserts these little carrots to indicate uh, what has changed. You just basically open up the file, fix the part that has the carrots, re-add it into Git tracking, and commit it, and you're good. Uh, yeah, okay. So uh, finally, kind of the largest challenge of working in a Jekyll site is to keep things simple. It's very easy for, for things to get increasingly complex, especially with that PDF workflow and the multiple outputs. And this is probably the main downside of using Jekyll is that you can build up these complex processes that only you understand or the person who built it understands. And then when you leave, everybody else is screwed. And uh, <laughs> it's, it's not a joke. That's really kind of how things happen. Uh, so in order to get around this, I tried as much as possible to to not use overly complicated code and we didn't use any extra plugins we just kept with the Jekyll core um, a lot of times custom plugins aren't 
uh, can't run on different systems or they're not compatible with all versions or they're not kept up to date and so forth. So we removed all that. We had all writers working in the same project. So if somebody's really weak in Jekyll, the other person can help out. Um, we, we tried to slow down the number of changes and I tried to stop introducing like enhancements to any kind of process or code uh, regularly. Uh, most writers, they don't, they don't like it when things change. Um, not everybody likes to dig around and tinker with tools. They like things as they are. They, they, they feel comfortable once they learn them. And if you keep pulling the rug out from under them, they get more and more annoyed uh, with you. And we tried to provide some standards, training, and so forth. Another big challenge is search. And there's no pretty way around this. Basically, static site generator, generators don't have search. And if you want it, you have to go use a, an external service. There are a couple called Algolia or Swift Type. These are awesome search services, and they're not free. So the search thing can be a deal breaker. Uh, fortunately, if your content is online, um, there are even easier methods. You could use Google Custom Search. You could not even have a search. A lot of people actually don't even care if you don't have search because they search through uh, Google anyway. Um, most people know how to do site searches. You could always integrate that into your site. That's what I've got in mind. I've got Google site search. Uh, but uh, without question, not having a more robust search internally that would work behind the firewall for content that's not online, that would index things robustly, is a huge weakness in static site generators. Uh, there is a way to implement search through something called Lunar, where it stores the content in JSON, but after you have about more than 60 or 70 files, it, it gets really slow and chokes. So, Another big challenge is translation. When you have all these different sites, uh, how do you send this off to your, your vendor? Uh, a lot of vendors don't take Markdown. They only process HTML, Word, or XML. So you've got some decisions to make there. Uh, fortunately, um, I was always able to find a vendor that could handle Markdown. A lot of it's becoming a more popular format. So a lot of these places, even World Server, or not World Server, sorry, even uh, mainstream vendors that use different systems, have created Markdown filters that can handle the content. But translation poses all kinds of challenges um, uh, about how you handle things. So it introduces a, another level of complexity. Um, I'm not going to get into that. Let me just close with a couple of things here and let me check the comment thread. Is there a way to leave a page in the repo but mark it so that it is not built? Yeah, you. each page in Jekyll has something called front matter. So if I come back to this, where's this about page? There we go. Up at the top here, there's front matter and this is in YAML format, uh, which is here was just key value pairs. But if you didn't want something uh, to be built, you can just do published false. Uh, or you can put a date in the future. Uh, so, And then it won't be included in the build. It's that easy. You could also put it in a folder called underscore drafts and then it won't, won't be built. Overall, Jekyll is quite liberating. Um, you're no longer tied to a specific vendor. You're suddenly in the world of uh, the general web with all the different tools available to you. It's very easy to do anything because you've got HTML, CSS, and JavaScript just as your bread and butter and anything works with it. Uh, UX designers love it. So you, you kind of have this sense of being unshackled. You're not limited in the help authoring tool world. If you're, if you're using a help authoring tool and you want to skin the output to look like your company website, you know, good luck. You usually have pretty strict limitations in what you can or can't do. I think a lot of that has changed, but by and large, uh, you have a lot more freedom. And there's a, an analogy that's good to consider with Jekyll, and that's to think of the first, first telephone. When Alexander Graham Bell came up with his first model of the telephone uh, and, and introduced it to the telegraph companies at the time, the telegraph was the mainstream way of doing communication, uh, they, they sort of laughed at it because Bell's first model 
was kind of the equivalent of two soup cans with a string. It was really staticky. You could barely hear anything. People said, this is never going to like replace the telegraph. But he kept working away on it, and it got better and better and better until one day uh, it put the telegraph companies out of business. And there's this whole uh, idea of a disruptive innovation. So if you look at this graph, I know there's a lot of different lines. I'm sure it could be drawn better. This is not even my graph. But uh, if you look at the red, just focus on the red. Uh, at the high end of the market, there's a certain level of performance that people expect out of tools. Um, and if you're a if you're a sustaining or if you're a mainstream technology, you're expected to make sustaining innovations, which are little tiny innovations that get better and better and better. If you're uh, like a developing innovation, you're at the low end of the market, uh, and your progress is is getting better and better. Like for example, with Jekyll, you can't do PDF. The search sucks. You can't tell whether links are broken. So it's it's not performing as high as the top the, the high the mainstream technology, but it's getting better and better and better. And at some point up in this graph, because the developing technology is uh, enhancing at such a rapid rate, it will overtake the, the high end of the market and will displace it. And then it becomes a disruptive innovation. This is um, in a book, I think it's by Clay Christensen on like, uh, I can't remember what it's called, but it's um, the kind of idea of these disruptive innovations is that they they bubble along in the background and you can't really you can't really see their progress until they wipe you out and then and then they're they're gone. Think of like the autonomous self-driving cars, right? They kind of seem like a joke at first, like these things, like they're never going to take over my car. How can this even work? And so we kind of forget about them. And then uh, like one of these days, we'll we'll suddenly wake up and like everything will be a self-driving car and the automotive industry will be turned on its head and, and a different market will kind of be emerging. So uh, that's how I like to think of Jekyll and that's how I sort of deal with some of the lack of, of some of these features. And one of the reasons why I think that, that Jekyll is so disruptive is this whole idea of social coding. Uh, when you have a GitHub repository, let me go to this on my site because it kind of blows me away whenever I think about this. Um, if I go into my GitHub repo and this theme that I developed, the documentation theme for Jekyll, it's been forked 222 times, uh, 370 people start it, and there's almost 40 people watching it. And this is just a theme that that I developed that's not even very good. It's not even well coded. <laughs> it's like I need a style, I just throw it into a style sheet. Uh, but the fact that people can make enhancements to it and contribute back for example, uh, I've already had six people just in the last week or so telling me what to fix. And they, they want me to merge back in their changes. So I need to go through and kind of check these out. Um, but the idea of social coding is that all the code is open. You see a feature that you like. You can see how somebody coded it. You can steal that code, incorporate it in your own, uh, share back if you want. But you can build on each other. Whereas the other model where everything is proprietary it's behind these closed doors you you generate your help out of some black box you don't know really what's doing it or how it's happening you can't innovate you can't you can't enhance it you can't do anything with it really it does what it does um i, I don't like that model as much as this open model and this social coding i think is what's going to give jekyll and other static site generators the kind of fuel to drive innovation and move upward on that performance and disruptive in disruptive innovation graph so yeah if you want to if you want to check out the documentation theme that I've built um, you're welcome to at this this uh, site I've got different versions I'm always trying to enhance it I've got another version I'm working on now that handles translation haven't published it but it's a lot of fun to just tinker around if you like building websites it's definitely the tool for you and that is it let me see if there are any questions um, I just see Thanks. We've had questions from Ken and Nancy and Faye Min. Anybody else have a question? Ask it. And while I'm waiting here, I'll just give a little plug for my site. Uh, I am recording this presentation. I'll put it on my site. You can check out the latest posts. Uh, I've got interesting things about Swagger here. 
I've got stuff even on FrameMaker and Madcap Central. I've got things on uh, TC Camp. Anyway, it's a way to keep up to date. If you like to read blogs, uh, definitely check out mine. And I've also got in the side below here, uh, if you want to follow more TechCom blogs, check out my, my kind of aggregated list on Feedly. You can find more things. But you're welcome to contact me as well through um, my contact page. I've got some information, uh, email, Twitter, Slack. If you haven't joined the Write the Docs Slack channel, definitely check it out. It's where a lot of fun things happen. Okay, what does Amazon use to build their docs? And is there plans to open source their docs like Microsoft? Oh, what a fun question. <laughs> no, Amazon uses different tools. Um, there's lots of different writing groups at Amazon. There's no one central tool. Uh, for But it's not really a secret what any anybody's using, so I can share the AWS team, which is the largest doc team, uses a, a modified version of DocBook. Um, for a lot of their stuff. They've also got a small group that's using Sphinx and storing content on GitHub. So they're it's kind of the more techie group. It's pretty neat to see their processes. Um, the retail, retail side of things, like if you buy a product and you want instructions for your Fire TV or your Amazon Echo and you find that on Amazon.com, I believe they use Ditto with Trisoft? I'm not sure. One of these content management systems uh, I'm not sure of all the details, but I know it's a database system. Uh, then there's a lot of splinter groups that use one-off solutions. Um, and uh, my group has sort of inherited this legacy content management system that we're trying to move away from. We're trying to implement a, we're trying to implement Jekyll, and we'll see if we can make it work. Um, you know, companies can make it difficult for you to to implement what you exactly what you want to do because they don't necessarily give you free access to the server so uh, we're, we're sort of dependent on an engineering team to make certain things happen but once we do we think it'll result in a more robust process that's more scalable definitely having engineers to help build things out like a like a nice search index and and seamless templating is, is a huge win so we're sort of in a waiting mode but we're definitely uh, my group is small we have eight writers or so with our products and we're using Jekyll and interacting with git uh, with our internal git and it's a lot of fun I think most people like it when, when you write in markdown and and mix in HTML where you need it um, it's it makes things a lot more enjoyable not always right if you've got some hassle that Markdown is being picky about, but by and large, it's a it's a lot more liberating. And working in a text editor like WebStorm, where you've got all these files on the left, and it's well organized, and you can easily do find and replace across the board, and build locally, and so forth. It's a it's a different way of working, and it's it's certainly enjoyable. All right, let's see if there's any more questions, and then I'll close this out. Uh, all right, well, thanks for listening to my presentation and I'd love to hear from you and hear about what kind of innovations you're doing so thanks again great Tom thanks uh, thanks very much on on behalf of the entire group uh, I'd like to, to thank you there there's a lot of really good uh, advantages challenges uh, solutions and and trade-offs that you've made there that's a, a good source of tremendous info here and resources and I'm, I'm looking forward to exploring Jekyll more on my own um, we customarily present our our live speakers with a small token of our appreciation in the form of a of a gift card. Usually, if uh, um, if someone from our group hasn't sent you one already, I'm I'm sure they will shortly. Uh, awesome. We'll get on that. But uh, um, yeah, you're welcome. Um, so thanks everybody who came out tonight uh, for your attention and for joining us this evening. I hope you found this beneficial. And uh, please remember our next event on February 15th, Automating Doc Builds so Writers Can Focus on Content with Ann Gentle. And uh, info for that is on meetup.com. All right, so uh, have a good night, everyone. And uh, thanks again, Tom. Thanks. Bye-bye.